What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Hollywood Already Did It Presents Buddies for Life, an episode-by-episode -episode recap of the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Disney Plus's second Marvel miniseries TV show, whatever you'd like to call it. And where we pair up a buddy cop film of any decade and discuss the evolution of that genre, the changes in it, how it's kind of connecting to our real world, which every week Falcon and the Winter Soldier does more and more. As always, I am your host, Blake Schultz, and with me today is Terrence Tatum. Hello, everyone. And Jamie Jer. Hello. And this week we're on episode five of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Truth. I have to assume because it's mostly about honesty. <laughs> the episode <laughs> picks up right where we left off after episode four, where we saw some of the most gruesome imagery in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, possibly in the MCU, if you don't count the decapitation of Thanos, the shrinking of that poor man and Ant-Man and getting picked up like a little snot clot, and several other times where they've accidentally been very violent. However, this time it was attached to a symbol that everybody has looked up to, and we keep seeing how that symbol has affected many, many people in the universe. In this episode, we struggle more with what will it mean going forward rather than what it has meant in the past Terrence, what did you think of this week's episode? Uh, it's it is not my favorite. Out of, like I, I like the previous two episodes more, but there are some very hard hitting things in there that will forever sit with me. This this episode unpacks some things that I I didn't I wanted them to get into that I did not think they were going to. Um, starts off with the whole basically Walker having PTSD and kind of just freaking out. But the bread and butter for me for this episode is Sam's sort of, this whole series now is it, clear what it is. It's Sam's sort of earning the shield, but earning it by having to dig up and go and, and, and destroy some of the archetypes of what we think that shield means or what America means. Like the flag, I mean, this is sort of what's happening in the real world. The, the flag and, and all of that don't mean the same for everybody as, as it does for a certain group of people. And sort of that's sort of what Sam has to, uh, come to come to grips with and he goes back to um meet the original <laughs> the original uh black super soldier and bradley they have a conversation and bradley's like hey yo n this world is never going to take a black captain america ever and if you're a black man and you want to be a captain america that says something about you and i was like whoa that is that is accurate because as much as this world is kind of spit on and kicked and shit on on people of color would you really want to be the representative of what that means and that's something that sam sort of has to wrestle with and it and his conversation with him and then the conversation that he has with bucky and bucky one thing we've already talked we've always talked about we always said that bucky knew who steve they had a conversation which is like ha we were right Told you that, um but bucky is like hey we never actually contemplated what this meant giving this to a black man and that's that's on us because that's something that we, in our white privilege, never would have come, would never would have thought about before, and that's just fascinating to kind of dive into, into in a comic book movie. <laughs> but it's just fascinating to sort of play with that type of stuff. I was like, oh wow, I didn't think we were getting there. Um, and it's this pen, penultimate episode is does a great job of just putting a lot of breadcrumbs on the board for whatever we do in the finale. It takes some off because we Zemo is sort of easily just sort of removed, but. Uh, I don't also think that they're, that's setting up for stuff in the future because we don't just mention the raft for the hell of it. <laughs> yeah, um, I totally agree. Uh, it wasn't my favorite either, but still, I mean, so powerful. And I totally, it's, we, I really never saw this coming in terms of the subject matter. And it, and it makes me so happy that they're, that they're going there um, because they didn't have to, but they should have. Uh, and uh, and it's it's refreshing to see, and uh, and it was weird because and I told you guys before we recorded that I, I watched um, the Trial of the Chicago Seven and Judas and the Black Messiah this week, and it, it's weird because those movies take place in like sixty nine ish, and then to go and watch the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it's very oddly dealing with similar subject matters except it's fictional, whereas those movies are about real people. And it's a little disheartening that it's like, I mean, those movies are new, but they take place then. And we're just, you know, we've discussed it before with these buddy cop movies, where it's just nothing has changed. And, um, and a good way to make change in media is to put these stories in the most famous franchise in the world. Um, is 
bring stuff attention to stuff um so that's pretty cool um but uh for me um you know as just a simple white lady certainly uh the chord that struck hardest for me in this episode was the appearance of julia louis dreyfus <laughs> contessa <laughs> i mean that was pretty fucking awesome uh i that was totally pretty, pretty awesome when she showed up so that was that was the highlight for me just to see julia louis dreyfus in the mcu and knowing that she's coming back is so she's having fun awesome. uh, clearly i mean i guess we this is one of those ones where Disney was like, hey, we had a plan. She was going to show up here first, but F it here. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting seeing everything out of order. I'm hoping she still is in the Black Widow movie where she was meant to make her original appearance and that we're not just cutting around or however we're going to do it. I, I have to assume that that's still there. But this might have been my favorite episode because they did a lot of the the stuff that I keep saying similar to WandaVision that we're never going to get in a movie. We're never going to have Bucky and Sam Bond over building a boat in a feature length film. We're never going to see just Sam doing target practice with the shield for 20 minutes. Which is we great. have an entire, I love, I could have watched it all day. It's so rare that an episode of TV can at the same time express two of the whitest parts of me where I'm like, I really miss playing ultimate Frisbee. But what of the systemic racism in America at the same time? <laughs> it also really made me miss when I was more physically active and did martial arts, but there was a while where I was like, man, I miss tossing around a disc. Um, <laughs> but I mean, we, we opened this movie with some of the best action we've seen. And some of the most film school symbolism that I will drink up like whiskey where we to get Sam to a place where he decides to be Captain America we literally had to rip the Falcon off of him we yeah. had to destroy the wings and like peel them away and that is the kind of like mise-en-scene 101 nonsense that I'm like oh it's so cool <laughs> we had to take away his original symbol to make room for him to grow. It's, it's amazing. It's fantastic. And then that uh, shot ends with Bucky just like dropping the shield at him. Like, we're not doing this again. Don't F this up this time. Like, you know that's what? literally how he drops that to him. I don't know why this made me think of that, but the way he show throws that shield down and walks away made me think of at the end of Moulin Rouge when Hugh McGregor throws the money at Nicole Kidman and he's like, go be a whore! whore. Well, it, it, it's like, directed. Know, it totally had that kind of level of drama, and I and I love it. That's what I. That's what immediately came to mind. <laughs> it's directed movie, in such a way. I was sort of with you, where I was like, "Is Bucky done?" Like he he throws it down with such disdain, almost that a part of me was like, "Has he decided Sam is Cap and is just out?" Like. What does this mean? Is he going to just go reconcile the white wolf and go back to the door of Milaje? And, and then we get this scene with Zemo and this conversation with him. And we echo this back to the Civil War moments. That we mirror the shot with Black Panther of the dead. The living is not done with you yet. He gets taken away. We get another philosophical nonsense conversation from him about what it means to be a person and what it means to be a hero and why blah 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 all great all fantastic we get sam i don't think i can think of one other scene in any Mar superhero movie where a white person cops up to basically being white the way bucky does with sam the way he really is like we didn't think about it and the more i i've said this on the show i think a few times it's really showing that Steve Rogers doesn't fit in this world anymore. And what this I think really proved to me was that we've seen Steve Rogers have the benefit of the privilege really of being the man out of time of growing up when it was easy to just be like America versus Nazis, rah, rah, rah. These are the bad guys and we are the good guys. And, you know, he's also from an era, they don't talk about this, but I, I that generation, that age group, and then there are younger people who say it too, kind of grew up with that idea of just, we don't see color. That was, you know, for so long what I heard. Well, don't see color, Blake. 
everyone's equal. Don't see it. And now that conversation is much more like, see it, but don't treat people differently because right. of it. It's like, I want you to acknowledge the fact that we are different. Just don't treat me like shit because we are. <laughs> and I feel like there was a lot of subtext of Bucky kind of admitting like, you know, we never thought of it this way. We just saw the world. I mean, it's a lot of the way that just America has always sort of treated itself. It's like, hey, we're the best country in the world. We do this and this and this, but let's not talk about how we got here. Let's never bring that up. You don't want to see how the sausages are made. Just eat them. Yay. <laughs> and, and really, what would Steve do now? Because the other thing, too, is, and his stories are written in a way that he doesn't have to deal with these kind of problems. But he also has the benefit, I was just saying this to a friend of the show, Andres, I was like, it's interesting watching the Falcon and the Winter Soldier and watching us deal with heroes killing people and watching John Walker do it. And then we talk about, well, Iron Man shot those terrorists with his little shoulder gun and we all thought it was cool and the Punisher exists. And we've seen all this discourse around Batman and Spider-Man and Daredevil and these characters were like, well, I have a code. It's like, was well, your code just laying them in the hospital and hanging them upside down? And I will beat like, you so that you will never walk again. I'd rather like, be dead. <laughs> what's what's really worse here? Like, but the, the Captain America movies have the same benevolence that the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies have where those villains die, but Spider-Man doesn't kill the Green Goblin. The Green Goblin kills the Green Goblin. And Spider-Man doesn't kill Doc Ock. Doc Ock decides to do it. And so, so Spider-Man's never killed anyone, but his villains are also gone now. And it's that kind of like weird hypocrisy that I think we're getting away from. When you look at the first Captain America and it was like, well, he never killed anybody in that movie. The Red Skull grabbed the Tesseract and floated away. But we've never challenged the idea of what if it didn't? And then even when we challenge him as a character and we go, take the red, white, and blue Boy Scout and put him in shades of gray. The Winter Soldier's shades of gray. What's right and what's wrong? It's actually not that complicated. The Nazis are still wrong. We're going to blow up the three ships and I'm going to save my friend. Civil War does the same thing. They go, well, it's complicated now. And it's like, well, actually, you still have this concept of what's morally correct. And it's why both Tony and Steve land in the same place. And, and they're both trying to achieve the same goals. It's not that complicated. This is the first time where it's like, well, there's nobody for Steve to punch here. There's no one for him to just talk truth and justice about. Because that girl would disagree with him. Yeah. A lot of other people would disagree with him. I think everybody on this board would. Like, everybody in this show, Morgenthau, uh, Sharon, Zemo, like, there's nobody that would be like, hey... And that's just sort of a, 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 sort of what the world is today. I mean, you turn on the news and you see what's happening. You're kind of like, yeah, this isn't just so clean anymore. You can't just type, type, tie a bow on America and be like, we're, we're the best. There's on a lot on of anybody, I think it even gets to an individualistic level where we're really Correct. kind of starting to be like, what do we and don't we forgive? And how do we and don't we move on? And how frustrated are people? But it does echo back to a lot of the symbols in our own country and what these mean and I think the show is saying that the world needs Captain America, but it doesn't really need Steve Rogers anymore. We, we still need somebody who inspires and, and believes in what's right, but that means a different thing now than it did right. when Loki showed up and we fought aliens. Yeah. And then you get to John Walker, who I'm liking more and more, because the more and more I think about his character, I go, this is somebody that we actually should feel bad for, because he's been given an impossible task. And, and I think if anybody thought of it, if, if one of you or I became the CEO of our company, or we were in a position of power, and everybody was just like, I don't care, and spit on our face, we'd be mad. If you worked that hard to get somewhere, and nobody cared about it, you'd be mad. There he's are, a, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, but he's a bad person who breaks. But when you really think about what he's going through, I'm like, he's doing such a good job playing this role because really, as we saw in this episode, he's also part of a broken system. When he stands at that podium and is like, I did it for you. You made me, you trained me, you taught me to do it this way. I did it all for you. And now you're just going to tell me to kick rocks. You're like, yeah, that's kind of what we do too. We breathe these things and we're like, oh no, the dog bit somebody. That's not how we wanted it to go. I mean, it's sort of what 
has happened to Bradley, where they're like, hey, we're going to give this and then we'll throw you away and you don't exist. That is what they are attempting to do now with uh, with Walker. So, yes, he is still a, a white male, but the second you go against the, the patriarchy or the, the, the big regime, they're like, cool, you're now going to get tossed out too. And look, I'm not on some of that Twitter bullshit where I'm like, finally, a cap who's doing what needs to be done. I think that's insane and completely missing the point. I just I think that, <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> no, that he's still a bad person. It's just interesting to be like, what, what happens when we give somebody an impossible? He's such a good character because it is true. I mean, America could give a fuck about their soldiers and their, and I mean, you know, if, if, and it's, I think Julia Weed Dreyfus says it, like if he would have done that shit privately, he'd still be Captain America. It's the fact that he, it was caught on tape and now it's on the internet. Um, I mean, it's all hypocrisy and everything. And, and, and that's, John Walker is a complex, really good character. And I'm excited to see what happens if, if, uh, if he dies or if he ends up in Thunderbolts or whatever happens. Put him but on the I, raft too. Everybody to the raft. <laughs> I also think, I mean, I, it's worth noting that um, Walker is first and foremost, his, he's, his, his, he's controlled by his temper and by his um, inability to make the right call because he's quick to action in not the right way in a way that he's impatient and he's, uh, and he's, bitter and angry but he was that way before they stripped him of his role and I think there um there's someone on Twitter that I really hate who is a important name in comics and I consider this person to be my mortal enemy even though they don't know me um they are a comic person and I hate them uh and they are one of the people that tweeted team walker I love John Walker team walker and and based on the reasons I don't like this person is because everything I, I there's been so much evidence that this person is sexist and that this person is unwilling to to change and unwilling to see they also are somebody who loved Harley's Suicide Squad outfit and then was like bashing their Birds of Prey outfits. Oh, I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, I really despise this person. And, um, and because of that, seeing this person be tweet team John Walker is like, oh, that is the only proof I needed that John Walker is not a good person. Well, and, that, <laughs> and that if anyone is seeing him as a hero, if you see yourself in John Walker, you need to go to therapy. I um, and that's just a fact. I mean, and, and there are things about him that are tragic and sad, and he did get the short end in certain ways in a, his job way, but he's still a per, the person he is, and and that's not a very good person or a hero. I mean, and add him to the list of why. Joker and Tyler Durden and Rick right. Sanchez and all these other characters that it's like the point of the show is to not be them. Well, yeah, you I mean, that's sort, of, Bojack Horseman. that's sort of what this entire series film is trying to sort of tell you it's like all right uh yes he has gotten the short end of the stick but it's clear that he still leads with his his his, his temper he's 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 his fist first sam has been given the short end of a stick on a lot of situations and why he's the perfect person to have that shield is because he's like look i need to go in and talk to this person before we actually go go in swinging and everything let me go have a conversation with morgan Thau. and it would have it was heading in the correct direction before walker went all john wayne <laughs> yeah these there's no sympathy there's no like this men yeah. don't have sympathy they don't understand they're unwilling these men uh are unwilling to understand their privilege and they're unwilling to, to see anyone else's side of things i did get in a twitter fight once with this person i've been not naming um <laughs> literally about it was about it's so stupid I, I never get in twitter fights but i got in a twitter fight with this comics creator about the nipple double standard and why it's not really fair that men can show their nipples and ladies, yeah. and women can't it's kind of insane there's like no and and he kept doubling down and like really just well that's the way it is women can't show their nipples and that's just the fact and it's like they're just just refusal to understand why no if you can show your nipples i should be able to show my nipples they're just right. they're the same they're nipples yeah, they're the no, exact same it's the exact same thing it looked like i was about to flash you but i'm not going <laughs> <laughs> but no i agree they are the same thing I, but that's a whole 
di- uh, line of dialogue about America and its sexuality of women and it's that's yeah fine. that's a that's a side story there's, there's a lot <laughs> yeah. of, i mean it's i think you know i have a lot of opinions on why we should be allowed to have everybody's nipples around yeah, it should do whatever the hell we unfortunately do. the falcon and the winter soldier is not dealing with nipples uh be a very very man you give me you give me systematic racism frisbee throwing for blake and nipples Shit, this it's might got be the greatest something. show of all time. There's one episode left. That's going to be my nipple episode. I don't know why, but I, the other thing I also like watching Sam train in a very like buddy cop montage. It felt so rocky. It, oh, it was great. But I had this moment where I was like, he's the only one who's done this without the serum. Like, and that just, actually makes it doing those doing flips. It. Yeah, doing his flips, catching the frisbee. I was like, that's kind of badass. I will say though, I can't wait to see whatever Shuri has cooked up for him in that in that uh, in that Wakanda. I will say, scene. Pulp Fictioning that suitcase is my one problem with the uh, this episode. Oh, I just, just show just show me the reverse just show shot. Show it to you. Just show <laughs> it to me. Mystery boxes was- never work. I think he's going to show up in that USA Wakanda vibranium style suit, and I'm all going to be I'm going to lose my shit. Yeah, I thought it was honestly. Of um, I think I said this on the Phase Zero podcast too. It's it was my favorite cliffhanger of the show. It's the first time I was like, yeah, this is a TV show, not a cut up movie. I, I, that I really hope if you stayed for your mid credit scene and saw John Walker making the I, I don't even know what to call it, the Marvel Legends version of this. The I can go buy it at Target. For I was $100. like, yeah, the Target. Yeah, I was like, so you do know everything else is made of vibranium. This I mean, isn't it, going to end well. A part of me is just like, it's going to break, right? Because like he's a super soldier now, which means he can whip it really hard. Right. It's it just shatter. It's just going to break. <laughs> um, so I'm excited for that. I've said it before. There's not really a reason to me in the Marvel Universe why we don't have a Wakanda vibranium shrinking ant-man iron man suit yet i don't know why all of these heroes who work together are like well i'm the ant-man i'll do my so you don't get the shrinking tech (laughs) yeah you're (laughs) iron man which means you don't get vibranium just right you don't get this just share it (laughs) just you should all be invincible suits tony could have saved had he just had vibranium I, all the times when Cap's like, oh, I got shot. If only I had better armor. And Tony's like, I summon 30 of them a day. <laughs> it's like, just make the man a suit. It really bothered me in Iron Man 3 when Rhodes is like, give me one. He's like, ah, they're all coded for me. And I'm like, Shane Black, this is a stupid bit. Just have him have a War Machine outfit for So him. there are 50 and Pepper just showed up in one. I call bullshit. <laughs> He's been spending this whole movie saying War Machine is better than Iron Patriot. And he doesn't have a War Machine outfit on deck. <laughs> all right let's talk about rush hour i don't have any smooth oh, transitions rush hour. yeah it's uh this is one that like like the la- the fir- our first chunk our first four were very easy to connect but this one is a little more difficult yeah I th- we'll find it sometimes i just say we'll find it as we go um uh, i have to tell you guys real quick because i'm i'm like shocked i said this to blake earlier but i am somebody who i have like a when it comes to movies i got a steel trap i rem, i can tell you what what every movie i've seen in theaters i know all my movies i really thought i had seen rush hour but i'm like 30 40 minutes into it and i'm like i i have not seen this movie before and i've I've, I've seen this movie so many times i was reciting stuff with them yes, as it was going along uh, i really liked it yeah it's a fun it's a fun ride it is it is a film that would probably have to change a lot of a things lot. being made today because yes, uh, there are a lot, of, especially in current, current, current climate, because um, there's a lot of stuff that, ooh. Uh, and in fact, my wife was off to the side uh, and not watching it with me and didn't see me if I was taking notes or not. And she knows that Blake and I do another podcast called You Can't Do That Anymore. And she's like, oh, this is going to fit on that show 100%. I was like, oh. Not for that one, but you are not wrong. Actually, no, we're going to use this one to pair it up with an episode about systemic racism in America. (laughs) (laughs) So the year is 1998, Um, and nobody knows yet that Brett Ratner is a monster. He's uh, only one of the most successful directors in Hollywood, and he has released Rush Hour with Chris Tucker and Jackie Chan. And if there was a better Venn diagram to just print money in 1998, I don't know what it is. The movie keeps yeah. on going with its lethal weapon tone. We get a lot more slapstick. We have Jackie Chan. Everything's a weapon in his prime. Chris Tucker, at, at peak Chris Tucker. 
And I got to tell you, this time watching it, I could just feel like Brett Ratner somewhere was like, come on, Chris, you know why everyone's watching it. Urban this one up a bit. I was like, how how bad do you think he was on this set? Because, because, oh boy. It's, it's funny knowing Ratner and what he's, what we know of him now. There were certain scenes like the whole uh, Jackie Chan, and it's, it's still funny because it is like a fish out of water and he's hearing, uh, Chris Tucker say, but him saying the N-word, you're like, this is one of those things where Brett Ratner's like, this is going to be great, guys. It's going to be a good time. Let's go ahead and do this. I really was struggling with that moment because I'm like, in the context, it's, it is funny. And it's, it, yeah. and it works because he doesn't know what he's saying. Right. But in the reality of the world, Jackie Chan still had to say it. And it's, so it's like, still makes you uncomfortable. Yeah. And I imagine at the time it hit really well um and i'd imagine even with black audiences as well it played well like i was in the theater for it it, it hit it hit it, it hit quite well um i don't know if it would hit as well today exactly <laughs> yeah yeah um, i think we used to be a little bit more uh it's hilarious <laughs> and you're yeah. right this scene plays because he's he's acclimating to a culture he has seen chris rock do it in the scene before and he says it with his big jackie Tucker. chan grin but it also, it, it doesn't really exist other than to like be kind of funny and then show off Jackie Chan doing stunts. It doesn't further the plot or the story he or the characters. He doesn't what went wrong. Right. Yeah. There's not, it's not like him and Chris Tucker have a scene after where he's like, now hold on. They don't have like the 48 hour moment that Eddie and Nolte sort of has. Like, yeah, what you're saying is you're being a bit of a dick. Um, they don't have that type of situation. This one's more played for laughs. And it, it like I said, it works. It's just... Uh, this is this is that hybrid because both like Chris Tucker was coming off of Money Talks, which was Brett Ratner's other film, and it was huge. Like that did way bigger than it had any right to do. And then Jackie Chan is known for like, hey, this guy does his all his stunts. And so this is that perfect marriage of like, let's merge those two together. And so you can see exactly when they're like, all right, at this point, Jackie Chan, go do Jackie Chan. And he we do a full on like 10 minute stunt stunt sequence. And it looks great and it fits within the story. It blends pretty well. It blends less in the subsequent sequels, but this one is a pretty good marriage of the of the the two versions of those those stories. Um Well, and I think it's also important to note, as we noted many times in our WandaVision podcast, and anybody who's noted anything when we've talked about Power Rangers will note, is that progress takes time. And that while there are some problematic jokes and issues in this movie, this is one of the first, if not the first, buddy cop action movie where the white people are just not in the leading roles. You're not here. We're and doing assholes. Like the cop, like all the white cops are like they're pretty racist and they're shitty. And it's nice that like there are no good white people in this movie. And yeah. then at the end, when Chris Tucker's like, "Fuck you, FBI guys. I'm LAPD. I'm not joining your your bullshit." um that was one thing that was nice like there were no there you weren't rooting for a single white person in this movie no uh which is rare i mean like you like you said for these type of films you usually the typical way to do these is a white male black man that's typically the way that these sort of go and that's been that case and this is one of the first ones bad boys demanding two black men but this is the first one where we're like we're going to take two different ethnicities and and merge them together and not neither of them will be white uh and it was fun um it didn't it was weird because i remember the time of when this came out i remember it being big it it played more as an urban film we sort of we sort of put jackie chan in that hey you're allowed to the cookout situation like type of situation that's sort of where he he fit into that and that's sort of what those movies had become um and i remember the the fever that when rush hour 2 came out shortly after it was like a huge phenomenon for this entire for these for these films um much the film was much much uh worse but but it was still uh fun like oh i can't wait to see these two together again because it's just a, it's an energy these two have well that's how most of these are happening they've been talking about four since the camera stopped rolling on three <laughs> that's what i and, thought and uh <laughs> they I are mean, but... running out of time so they're running out of time going. obviously they're gonna have to use a different director um but i know this was a tv series for a hot second too and it didn't take off so uh and chris kind of quit hollywood he did yeah he did he i mean he was on fire and then he just took off um he came back and did some smaller stuff he's with, so good in silver linings playbook silver linings, nine yeah, like, years ago yeah um but even like but before that he had a huge like gap of time before he was mm -hmm. he was doing anything else uh 
it was it's funny because he was it's sort of in line for a while there to be the next Eddie. Um and his trajectory was heading that way. Like he was doing some different stuff, like Dead Presidents, he was great in a drama, he was great in Fifth Element. I love Fifth Element. Yeah, Fifth um, Element's amazing. And then this was sort of his leading vehicles. And then after the rush hours, he just dropped off the planet for a bit. And I don't know if what it was or, or what he was doing, but yeah, he sort of stepped away. Um, I wouldn't and- be surprised if he was like, Brett Ratner treated me like shit. Hollywood treated me like shit. I was going to say, I think it's a very similar Chappelle story where he just kind of one day was like, this is all crazy. Like, yeah. Yeah. But outside of that, the movie, you know, this is a very interesting movie because I, I often try very hard to find the like the depth and the influence and what did it do and how did this further. And every now and then you have a movie like this that just sort of is good. That just kind of is like, it didn't really say too much deeply. It, we didn't break the genre. We weren't making omelets in the kitchen. We weren't innovating. It's just like, this was just a good script with great chemistry they bring up the war song. The biggest theme is really Chris Tucker thinking he wants to be part of an institution and then saying he wants to be part of the LAPD, which like great personal moment, weird now. <laughs> it's an odd choice now. <laughs> yeah. Even in the 90s, um, that's a weird choice. This, this is. had to be I, right I feel around. Like this has to be the Reginald Denning OJ. Like, I feel like, yeah, I, I feel like he. Either way, no matter what the time LAPD you watch, did not have a great track record no. in the nineties. No, uh, yeah. can't, not that cops have ever really had a great track record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it always is going to sneak in. Like it, it, it's so funny because this movie it does the very like the simple A to B of like let's connect these guys. These guys are two fish out of waters to each other. They don't really like each other, and then like hey. We don't have much depth on the scripts to sort of put them together. Let's have them sing war to each other and sort of bring them together. And then let's have a quick dialogue about how their fathers are both were former cops and cool. Now they're BFFs. And that's sort of what turns them from being, I don't really want to hang around with Lee anymore. So like, Lee's my dude. Let's go. Yeah. Um, They kind of have like the deepest it really gets is symbols are dumb and legacies are dumb and like pave your own way right like that's kind of we have these conversations about their dads and getting out of those shadows and being their own person and these ideas of like being part of be it a family or the fbi and then kind of being like i am gonna go do it myself which again when you're leaving one institution for another institution it leads me to believe that the script didn't try to get deeper than it was because that's i don't know kind of like not wanting to work at amazon so you can go work at walmart (laughs) <laughs> uh, you're just kind of trading out one for the other yeah. FBI in this case being Amazon and Walmart being the LAPD of course. Uh, there is one thing that I really my like my favorite moment in the whole movie was not a purposeful moment it was in the bloopers in the end uh, the, oh, the those bloopers. are the best parts and I love the rush hour bloopers yeah they're really good um, and it's you know Jackie Chan is this brilliant man who has who's who's talented in so many ways and he speaks two languages uh, if not more i don't know if he speaks anymore i don't know um and so yeah his english isn't amazing but he can speak more languages than me and he can speak more languages than chris tucker and and in in the in the end credits they chris is like has to say something in um mandarin i think um and uh, and he can, and he's struggling. And Jackie Chan's like, "See, right. I, you make he's fun like, of me." Because I think it was only three words. I think he only had to do three words mm-hmm. that, and, and he was like, "He can't even say this." I have an entire. See how hot it is for me. And he was just kind of joking, but I was like, "Yeah, that's he's not wrong." No, it's people who who English is their second language, and you know, you know, I just binged all of Modern Family, and uh, and uh, Gloria gets it all the time, like makes fun of her accent and everything, and occasionally it's brought up. It's like, bitch, no. No, I speak two languages. This is my second language. I'm not stupid. I just, it's not my first language. And, and, and that is I, so important for us to remember because, um, because again, I only speak English and I'm really bad at languages. I've never been good at it. And, uh, and if someone doesn't speak English well, but they can still speak English, they can do more than I can do. And we do not respect people well enough. I mean, that's um, why the whole... Like, the whole response that because Jackie doesn't speak for the first part of this and when he just lets Chris Tucker goes and he's like no I can I, I can speak I just let you speak and I'm just gonna hear you say because you're saying a bunch of dumb shit and <laughs> once once you say something worthwhile I'll I'll chime in. 
I think that really for me was the hardest pill to re swallow on this movie of like, I don't, I don't really want to watch him make fun of Jackie Chan not being able to speak English for 10 minutes. It's a, it's an they're interesting, both so much better than this. Yeah, so it's an interesting beat that happens when it was happening. I was like, oh, and he goes to this, like, I'm gonna drop you off at uh, Panda Express. I was like, oh. Oh, this is some of the stuff is. Yeah, is there's a lot of like, ooh, guys. I know it was the late '90s, and we just didn't seemingly care. There's a part that I mean, it doesn't happen because it it happens when he gets kicked. He's about to say, "I'm going to slap the yellow off of you," but he is kicked before the yellow part comes out. And I'm like, I am so glad that he got kicked in the head right there because I don't know if that would have still. Yeah, worked in a very in weird way, similar to the Marvel heroes who like kill people, but then are like, "Oh, should we have done that?" Uh, I feel like Hollywood executives would be like, "We'll be racist until it's too racist." <laughs> like, I can, there's yeah. so many bits that are like, and right here is where they're gonna say it but then they're going to get cut off. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, you spent the whole movie being xenophobic. So I don't know that this really <laughs> is saving the, the, I guess the Joker in the card deck doesn't mean much. Yeah. I card. guess this is a good line to have in the sand, but it feels like there was a lot of sand that we could have moved up. It's weird because I think part of the reason I thought I've seen this movie before is because there are moments I've seen a million times. And one of those moments is Chris Tucker yelling, uh, do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? That that's like famous. Him yelling that his here, delivery. Yeah. And, and it's Chris Tucker. So it's the delivery of that is funny. But 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 that it just, oh. Well, God, that's, a, that's a part of a lot of the lines in this movie where it's like in lesser hands and lesser capable hands, a lot of the stuff would have come off much more hateful and harsh because Chris Tucker is doing it in his, his high pitched voice, it's sort of like, all right, I, I can, I can accept. And it, it, you're doing like the spoonful of sugar type stuff when you're doing the medicine, like, all right, cool. I can kind of take this um, as opposed to somebody who's, it doesn't feel as hateful. It just feels more like, oh, this guy's, he's, a, he's an idiot. He's in, he can sort of accept it more in that. Way. I also think there's a weird underlining thing in some audiences where they're like, well, the black person and the Asian person can't be racist to each other. But if it was a white person saying, if like Jim Carrey was doing it, right. we would have been like, oh no. Correct. That There's probably some of that too, where it's like, oh, they're being it's sort of being racist to each other. They're like, well, that's more acceptable. It's not a majority of uh, like a, a, a white person saying it. Then we're like, hold on, stop the movie. <laughs> Both of these guys need to, need to get this in this now. Uh, some other fun bit of trivia that I just learned is that Rush Hour was the catalyst for Rotten Tomatoes. Really? The, the founder of Rotten Tomatoes, Send Wong, the website's founder, was a big Jackie Chan fan and was inspired to make the website after collecting all of the reviews of Jackie Chan's Hong Kong action films as they were being released in the U.S. That's really cool. That is <laughs> fascinating. I know some people don't like Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm a bit, I actually really love Rotten Tomatoes because um, I, I uh, except never look at the scores for comedies. Comedy's too subjective, uh, but, but I They're think- They're always uh, 50s. It's always 50. Yeah. Comedy, comedy aside, I do think it's a helpful tool when trying to decide what you want to watch. I think you're, on the, smart I think enough you're on the fence for some stuff. Yeah. yeah. I think if you're on the fence for things, it's a, it's a good way to say, uh, maybe I shouldn't waste my time. Don't, well, don't make it your Bible. Right. Um, but and now sometimes, sometimes occasionally things I write get counted towards the scores. And then I feel bad. I'm like, I have to be nice because I don't want to bring these poor people who worked hard in this movie score down. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny like... that you mentioned it. I haven't watched it in a while, Blake, but it's funny you mentioned it because uh, uh, Jackie Chan did Shanghai Noon and Night with Owen Wilson, which is a white male. And I like the first one. I don't really remember the second one. Nobody likes remember, the second one. I can't remember. Yeah, I never, I, I don't remember it at all. But I can't remember how edgy or touchy that gets on that. Because I, I really can't see Owen Wilson throwing out some of those. I It's not things. nearly at this level. Yeah, I just can't see that working there in that same, that same manner. But the movie's still great. A lot of good physical comedy. A lot of great bombastic climax action. I can watch jackie chan in his prime and in animated form in the jackie chan adventures which is a really good cartoon it's it a great a really cartoon it's really good i don't know why paramount plus isn't rebooting it i don't even know if they have the rights i just decided that they did in this moment <laughs> it could be owned by anybody but it seems like something that would have been on cbs <laughs> 
Yeah. I don't know how this movie connects to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so I'm just going to say uh, that instead it was the next movie that we had on our list for these genres. But but really what it does, though, is it does show you the evolution, right? This was a 1998 movie. And the 90s were such an interesting time because things weren't great. They weren't that bad. We weren't involved in any major wars, we weren't really making villains who were based in those wars. We didn't have the, the Russians or the Chinese or the Soviets or the Red Scare. It was things like the Matrix. We had to create something. Oh, the, the, it's the technology. And I think Rush Hour kind of has a little bit of that where it, it echoes a simpler time, but it was like, we don't really need to put any super depth into this movie. We're just going to have audiences sit back and have a good time. And when you look at where we are now and what the Winter Soldier is doing and what this genre is doing, that Hollywood has been doing forever, it, it is becoming a tool to teach. And I think Rush Hour has that in some ways. I think we have moments of Jackie Chan saying the N-word and then getting <clears throat> karma for it, but he doesn't get educated about it. We have Chris Tucker making all of these negative assumptions, but it's for comedy and not for the education's sake. And now Falcon and the Winter Soldier gives us another racially tense story. And instead of just leaving these things to the side, it's become the meat of the story. Where I, I think we're seeing the evolution here of like, it's for the comedy and we're just sort of crossing our fingers that you walk away a better person. You got it, right? <laughs> don't say the n-word in bars don't make fun of asian people they'll understand where falcon and the winter soldier is no longer assuming we will understand right. they're like let's let's talk about this we have to have a conversation guys this was my favorite episode i still am a little concerned that we're not going to get everything we want in the finale there's that's one my more fear. left because i mean it's probably only going to be no more than an hour but there's a there's quite a bit of stuff that needs to i would like to i would like to get doesn't need to but there's a lot of stuff that i would like to get tied up and i don't necessarily think we're going to get all of them. i mean we still don't even know who the power broker is do we no we're all just assuming I mean, it's Sharon. Sharon. we're just i think that's Sharon. the red heron it's a I red herring the, the red, red heron. heron yeah the red Sharon. Um, Especially because she just keeps dropping into the middle of an episode, like, oh, she hasn't been around, and she just shows up on the phone, like, for a quick ten, four minute sequence of her on her phone, and like, and then that's it. I'm like, this is a little, you I keep hope bringing we get her up more. and misleading us. Yeah. Yeah. I really think that, I genuinely think we are going to get a season two called, like, the new Captain America and the White Wolf or something like that. Like, I really, like, I, like, WandaVision was a clear one and done. You cannot have a WandaVision season two, but right. I think we are going to get another bucky sam show but they're gonna it's gonna be retitled with their new model yeah i think he, i don't know I, jamie i think season two of wandavision is just gonna be a bunch of podcasts that wanda likes and they're gonna uh have a lot of philosophical conversations and we'll see the evolution of the audio medium i like it but yeah i do definitely think they're gonna he's going to be known as captain america from this point on um so i, I do think you'll we'll start using that name for him from now on yeah i would uh i would love that i feel like this is the first one where i'm like we could do a season two and then candidly because we also the other thing we didn't talk about we've set up the next falcon he gave those wings and so i'm like yeah. will we could we could keep going yeah well i, I think joaquin is going to be a part of the, like the young avengers for sure new falcon i think that that's a hundred percent happening yeah there are a lot of threads, like breadcrumbs in here. The whole Contessa thing, you don't get Julie Louis Dreyfus to be a one-off. No, no, no. She's, She's either yeah. pretending to be blind in Arrested Development. <laughs> <laughs> or... It did make me think of that because of like the courtroom vibes. I did think of Arrested Development. A part yeah. of me was like, I'm so excited for us to get Daredevil back on the table and just see all the memes of Julie Louis Dreyfus and Arrested Development. <laughs> I love that like Julie Louis Dreyfus is Chris Evans' biggest crush and they put her in after he's after he's gone. gone. For Chris Evans. <laughs> he's... And in the comics, the Contessa and Cap, I think, have a little fling. So I, I bet you he's feeling a little bitter right now that he's not getting his uh JLD. <laughs> he's, uh, he's somewhere on the moon. <laughs> uh he's not, he's in the ground. He's six feet under. Yeah. Captain America's dead. <laughs> is he? I don't know. I thought they kind of implied it here when Bucky was like, look, it doesn't matter what Steve thinks, he's gone. And right. I was like, okay, I feel like that means 
Because also, right. like, he'd be watching all of this unless he teleported back to his unless other he went world. Back his old person. Yeah, I yeah, think I... he went to like the the timeline he's supposed to be in. But if that timeline mirrors our timeline, outside of small differences, there should be a John Walker messing stuff up there too. And he yeah, would... but no, because if in that timeline he there wouldn't be a cap replacement. It wouldn't. It told, he wouldn't need to be replaced. I I don't think he was. When he went, I don't think he was. Oh, like, because that cap would have stayed. Yeah. Oh, good point. They would have. Oh. Just, they would have probably used his blood, but here he would have yeah. actively just given away his his blood. Oh, like, Jamie, that's a good me. point. There's like a, they wouldn't have gotten to the point. You where wouldn't needed, have gotten where to. They watch. were testing a bunch of other people to test it. They're oh, like, oh, we still man. have the person who's actively the super serum, so we'll just use his. We'll take his blood, and he would have willingly given it. It's a good point. I didn't if it's even that. in another timeline, because that's still a gray area. Uh, the writers and directors cannot decide, but you okay. know who can decide? Loki. Yes. Yes. I'm so <laughs> excited for Loki. I, I can't, can't wait, wait for our Loki show. So oh, this, yeah. I love this series, but this is a series that I have not been watching at midnight. Loki, I will be watching at midnight. I watched this time. one at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> After I saw that bloody shield in the morning, I <laughs> hopped on at midnight. Way easier than the WandaVision servers. <laughs> I'm already awake at, every, at midnight. I don't go to bed till 2 a.m. anyway, so there's no reason for me not to watch it at midnight. On that note... I no, think that's it, guys. No, uh, exciting way to end. My bedtime. I, I were just not segueing well. I had nothing to get us to rush hour. <laughs> I had nothing to get us to the connections to Rush Hour to Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And I have nothing to get us to the end. You could do just like Rush Hour when they don't have anything. Just like, let's just sing war together and close it out the film. I don't know that anybody wants to hear us sing war, but if you want to try it. (laughs) What is it good for? Absolutely Absolutely nothing. nothing. Guys, that's our show. Uh, please still give us five stars after that beautiful rendition of War. What is it good for? Then you can, of course, follow the show on YouTube. You can hit subscribe or on the Apple iTunes app where you hit subscribe. You can do those two things. You can go to Twitter at Hollywood ADI on Instagram at Hollywood already did it. I'm at, as always, Blake Terrence at Terrence Tatum. Jamie is at Jamie Cinematics. We, of course, do another show Terrence already mentioned called You Can't Do That Anymore. I, of course, do another show called How Do You Figure about action figure collecting. And Jamie has all of her work on comicbook.com and sometimes appears on Phase Zero. Great. And follow me on Letterbox because I'm really obsessed with Letterbox now. <laughs> and if you want to see my three Letterbox D lists, the Spider Man movies, the MCU, and Star Wars, they're at, as always, Blake. Uh, spoiler, Spider-Verse is the best one, Empire Strikes Back is the best one, and Winter Soldier is still the best one. Right behind it is Black Panther. I don't make the rules, but that is the (laughs) correct order. (laughs) And we will see everybody next week.